So now to the 2021 uh, James Cook Winners Lecture, uh, which is being presented by Professor Rosa Mull, AC, uh, who is uh, leader of the Particles and Catalysis Research Group at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, and co-director of the ARC Training Centre for the Global Hydrogen Economy. Her current research focuses on designing nanomaterials for solar and chemical energy uh, to convert uh, to uh, uh, various applications and to use solar energy to generate clean fuels. Rose's numerous awards include the Free Hills Award in 2008, the New South Wales Science and Engineering Award for Emerging Research in 2011, the ExxonMobil Award in 2012, and being listed in Australia's top 100 most influential engineers in 2015. Rose was, uh, received the nation's top civilian honour, the Companion of the Order of Australia, as part of the 2018 Queen's Birthday Honours for her eminent service to chemical engineering, to education, as a researcher and academic, and to women in science as a role model and mentor. Professor Ramal was named the 2019 New South Wales Scientist of the Year. So please welcome Professor Ramal to the stage. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Susan, for the kind introduction. And I also like to once again thank you to the Royal Society of New South Wales for giving me this opportunity to share with you this evening on uh, a topic, research topic that I have been doing for over uh, uh, 15 years. So this is harnessing solar energy through catalysis. And, and, and this evening, I'm going to talk about how to use that energy to make chemicals and fuels. Well, our sun is um, over 150 million kilometers away, but we can still feel its heat as well as see its brightness because of its gigantic energy. And um, I'm not going to bore you with all those numbers, but I guess that the, what we want you to get up from this particular slide is that if you look at in the table there, two hours of sun irradiation, it's enough in order to supply the energy the whole year for the planet. Uh, we only consumed roughly about 595 exajoules last year. So it's enormous, and there's a lot of potential of the uh, sun energy that we can harness. When I gave presentations about re the use of solar, solar energy and how we should harness the solar energy, um, and previously I always used the examples of that uh, the significance of it is about global warming because we need to uh, go, uh, transit away from fossil fuels and using the renewable energy. And most of the time, I would say that, that it will be of interest of scientists like me or engineers like me or environmental, um, environmentalists or, or, or climate activists. But as you can see from the slide there, there's a lot of interest now from the government. Many, many nations now pledge in order to be, meet the net zero target. This slide is a little bit out of date because it uh, was 8th of June 2021, and at that time, Australia hasn't committed yet for our net zero target, but at the end of 2021, Australia also joined uh, the, the many countries in order to pledge the net zero target. So, Australia is actually is the highest uptake of solar rooftops in the world. And 9% uh, of our energy now is coming from the solar energy, and it increased quite rapidly. And uh, if you look at just the two statistics there, in 2020, because I sort of give presentations every year and I update the statistic, in 2022, you can say that one in five households have rooftop PV, but now it's about 30% of the household got the PV and the amount of energy that coming from those rooftops is also increased drastically as well. So we all know we can use sun energy, 
in terms of to use it and harvest it to make electricity. But as we know, sun energy is intermittent. So when the sun doesn't shine, cloudy day, we cannot use it, and therefore that we need to store it. And mostly we normally use battery in order to store it. Um, yes, it's one of alternative, uh, but it's, um, it's only, there are also some disadvantages, like for example, battery only can store a, a sort of short time periods. If you want to store the energy for weeks and months, you have to use alternative. That's the reason that uh, people looking at other alternatives is to store that sun energy in chemical um, molecules, for example, hydrogen. And you might heard that, that there's a, the, the potential of uh, exporting hydrogen that's produced by sun energy to different countries like Japan, South Korea, even to Europe like Germany as well. So those are the things that people think that's also we can use in terms of harvesting the sun energy, not just to use this as electricity. So how does my research fit into this? So my research is uh, as a chemical engineer, we're looking at designing processes in terms of to uh, make or manufacture chemical. And one of the research that I'm working on is uh, for a long time is to design catalysts or catalysis system. And in my research here, we're looking at to harness the whole solar spectrum. So if you look at the solar spectrum in the, the left side, um, it's we got about 5% of UV light, about 43% of visible lights, and about more than 50% of the infrared, which is the heat. So my research is looking into using the catalyst to, to, to harvest all those, the whole solar spectrum. And using the photocatalyst in order to harvest the photon of the sun, so the light of the sun, using the thermal catalyst to harvest the infrared part of the sun, which is the heat of the sun. Or we can also use the electricity uh, that from the sun energy, so using the solar cell to generate the electricity and use the electricity to activate the catalyst in order to drive the chemical reactions as well. So those are the, uh, pro the, the, the research that I'm doing is to use the catalyst in order to harness the whole spectrum of the sun energy. I was actually talked to my older brothers uh, recently because um, I was telling him about my project, my work, which is harnessing sun energy to make hydrogen. And one of the projects that we're doing, uh, with, uh, funded by DFAT, is to look at feasibility of shipping that hydrogen to Germany. So I was telling him that, you know, I was working on harvesting the sun energy and, and put, making hydrogen and bottle it, putting a bottle and then ship it to Germany. And he said, did you remember when you were little, maybe about four or five years old, you, you used to ask us whether we can catch the sun and put in a bottle and use it at night time. I came from Indonesia. I came from a city called Medan. And around 60s and 70s, uh, we always have a blackout. And so at night time, we have to use candles. And I always, always sort of say that, why can't we, you know, catch the sunlight? And maybe I thought I thought that like catch you know fireflies like that and 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 in use at night time. So I think that perhaps subconsciously it's already in my mind that you know I would like to have a sunlight one day and to you use it in terms of to power um, you know our planet to power the chemical manufacturing as well. And mentioned about catalyst a number of times and it also my title I have catalyst. So what is actually catalyst? So catalyst is a substance that you put in the chemical reactions, and what it does is that it will speed up the process. Without catalyst, the, the chemical reaction will not occur, or will occur, but very, very, very long time. So the catalyst, when you put it in, the, the reactions, what happens is that it will lower the activation energy. So the cartoon there, it sort of indicate, uh, or show it to you what, what the catalyst actually do. It gives you a shortcut of the chemical reactions. Um, so if without the catalyst, you have to go through all the barriers and it will take a long time in order to cross from the start to the finish. But with the catalyst, it will give you a shortcut, cut through the tunnel perhaps, and, and, and give you a pathways to be able to go to the finish line in a much shorter time, in much less energy. But the thermodynamics of it, it will not change. So the energy of the reactant and energy of the product is still remain the same. It's just the pathways is changing. So that's what the catalyst is doing. So when we're talking about um, photocatalyst, which is a catalyst that is activated by sunlight, that means that 
uh, without that, that catalyst, the sunlight alone will not be able to be able to drive that chemical reactions. Uh, it may be, but maybe it takes thousands of years in order to do that. So the catalyst will be the one that speed up the reactions. And in my group, we're using different methods in order to make catalysts. Because it, it's, it's sort of part of uh, the thing is that, and I always sort of say to people that the different methods is actually give you different properties of the catalyst. We're using the flame synthesis method. So it's sort of flame is the reactor. Uh, we're using also anodization. Anodization is using electrochemical processes to sort of like to corroding the, the materials to make the materials that we want. Uh, or hydrothermal precipitation. Hydrothermal precipitation, you're using pressure and temperature in order to cook the catalyst. Um, I also like to use the analogy like, you know, when you're cooking food, flame synthesis is like you're using torch. So if you want to make a, bu a buri wagyu, which is a short residence time, but uh, cook just at the, uh, the, the, the high speed, then you, you got that, that type of catalyst. Um, but if uh, hydrothermal precipitation is like pressure cooker, so if you want to make pulled beef, then you're using hydrothermal precipitations in order to cook it for a long time to get that properties. So the same things when we make catalysts, because the different catalysts will have different properties that suit different applications. Some catalysts, you want it to have a lot of defects, a lot of uh, vacancy, which is suitable for a certain particular reactions or to be selective as well. While other catalysts, you want it to be more crystalline, more cooked, so then you're using process like hydrothermal precipitations to make it. Um, photocatalyst, as I mentioned earlier, is a, a process that you're using um, the, the catalyst to harness the light of the sun. So how does it work? This uh, cartoon will sort of show it to you how it's sort of uh, activated. So it's a very simple way. Uh, in fact, that in, in reality, it will be much more complicated. So if we have a photocatalyst, if you illuminate it with light, then it forms this so-called electron hole pairs. So with the electron hole pairs, hole is like an electron vacancy. So if you have water molecules or organic that's in contact with these holes, this hole, that means that there will be have an electron transfer. So the, the water molecules or the organic will be oxidized. So if it's a water molecule, it will form a hydroxyl radicals. And the electron that was generated will be, if you have uh, oxygen in the environment, if you have air, the oxygen will react with the electron to form some sort of uh, activated oxygen as well. And all those activated oxygen and hydrocell radicals are very highly oxidizing. So in some of the applications that I worked on earlier, which is to looking at uh, degradations of organic pollutants in water, if I have the photocatalyst, I illuminate the light, and I have uh, organic pollutants in there, say for example, dye, for example, the dye will be discolorized. So the organic pollutants will be degraded or oxidized to form CO2 and water. So it's one of the ways to be able to clean up some pollutants in water. And the good thing is that um, normally when you wanted to oxidize organic like that in water, you need to put put in a chemicals like hydrogen peroxide or permanganate. But with the photocatalyst, you can put the photocatalyst and then you can put uh, illuminate with the light and that's all you need. And the catalyst can be used again and again. I think one thing that I forgot to mention is that one of the good things of catalyst is that it will not be consumed during the reaction. So it's a, it's a, a material substance that you can put into the chemical reactions, lower the activation energy, speed up the reactions, and you can use it again and again. So that's one of the projects that we're doing and, and uh, was supported by water industry is, is to using something more sustainable. So something that you can use again and again and using energy that's abandoned, which is sunlight, in order to clean water. But at the same time, we can use the same science in order to also looking at how to use this method to make hydrogen. And, and but um, th this is the project that uh, it's we call the photocatalytic reforming project, and I call it also a project that kill two birds with one stone. Um, I don't I know that it might not be a good phrase to use. Um, what I mean is that it's a one process, but with that process you can make hydrogen from this process using sun energy as the uh, the the renewable energy, and and you can also make. Uh, other organics as well. You can selectively oxidize that organic to, to, to make a certain uh, products that you want. And the, 
right hand side is the uh, photocatalyst reactors that we use and we normally test the, the catalyst also on the roof so that we can utilize the sunlight directly. Most of the project that we're doing, we normally did it in our laboratory first using the artificial light. But um, after we choose or we found the, the right catalyst, we also bring it up to the roof in order to test it using the sort of uh, closer to the real applications because we can use the sunlight directly. So in that particular reactors, you, you see or the system, you see that there is a solar panel and there are tubes. Uh, the, those tubes are the, the, where the, we put the catalyst, put our photocatalyst. And the solar panel is actually not used to um, activate the, the, um, the reactors, but it's mainly used in order to power the pump. So that particular system by itself, you can use it to make hydrogen. Um, so if you illuminate the light onto the reactor system, the glass reactor system, and having the solar panels in order to circulate the, the slurry, the suspensions of the catalyst that you, we have, uh, we will be able to collect hydrogen that's coming up from, from that particular reactors. In that particular reactor system, uh, it's, it's quite small. We can make about 100 milligram per hour of hydrogen uh, uh, with, with that, using the catalyst that we, we develop in our laboratory. So the good part of this particular system is that it's a one-port synthesis. Um, it's uh, able to transform waste into valuable organic products. And also, it's minimal external electricity supply required. For people who probably know uh, that, that nowadays hydrogen is quite popular, and green hydrogen particularly, this is very popular. And the green hydrogen, they, they would like to make it from green electricity, which is from either wind energy or, or, uh, or sun energy. And then they use that energy to power the electrolyzer. Electrolyzer is an is a electrochemical process, which I'm going to explain too, um, and, and to split water to make hydrogen and, and, and oxygen. But, but the problem with that is that you need an electrolyzer, and electrolyzer is quite um, capital intensive, quite expensive as well. So the good things of uh, using photocatalyst is it's something that you can use probably in developing countries remotely as well, um, uh, without having to really buy a very expensive electrolyzer. In addition to do the, the, the design of the catalyst, we're doing also a lot of cost analysis. And the cost analysis is very important for us in order to find out also whether that process is viable. So the photocatalyst process itself is, hasn't been used commercially. The, uh, one of the reasons because is that the, the cost is still quite high. Um, and we're doing some co cost comparisons. And what we found from that cost comparison is that the, the efficiency of the process need to be improved by uh, five times, uh, sorry, yeah, five times before that, that particular uh, process can be viable. So we, we did a comparisons with using a panel um, as a, as a photoreactor panel means that the, the catalyst is immobilized onto the react system. Slurry is when the catalyst is in the suspension. And if you're the, currently the photo efficiency is less than 1%. So if we can improve the photo efficiency to 5%, that it can get to the cost that is more viable. And we're also working on the uh, designing the catalyst. And a lot of the catalysts nowadays, we are using materials like uh, uh, metal, metal oxide, platinum, uh, which is very expensive. And one of the report from the International Energy Agency is actually that was released last year, showing that if we wanted to move to the energy transition, the renewable energy, we will use a lot of minerals because a lot of the things that we're talking about now is, you know, we're going to use battery that will require a lot of lithium and will require a lot of cobalt. And if we're going to use, for example, like I mentioned, but electrolyzer or solar, solar cells and so on, we use a lot of minerals. So a lot of the work that we're doing in the catalysis is that we're trying to reduce the amount of minerals we, we need, and especially to reduce the, the expensive, uh, the, the need to use the expensive minerals like platinum, for example, because platinum is one of the catalysts that use a lot in, in either in making hydrogen uh, or in, um, other processes as well. So we're looking at look, using or designing catalysts that is made from carbon, for example. And um, so one of the work that we're doing is to looking at using carbon nitride. So carbon nitride, it means that the element of that materials is only carbon and nitrogen, which is very abandoned. And 
the project that we're doing here is, is looking at uh, the using waste from food waste or from brewery waste and then use this as a feedstock for in terms of for hydrogen. Uh, and then again, th this is very important because when we're talking about that we're going to make the hydrogen using water, for example, we need to know where the water coming from as well. And uh, for dry country like us, al although this year is not too bad, um, but back in 2018 when we were talking about making hydrogen from water, when we talked to the, our state government, they did ask us, where are you going to get your water? Because water is a f uh, also a commodity that uh, you know, is, is not, not something that we have a lot as well. Okay, so that particular project, with, when you're talking about photo reforming, is using the light directly in terms of activate the catalyst to make the hydrogen. I also mentioned that we can also use the electricity that coming from the solar cell and using the electron in order to activate the catalyst to make hydrogen. So again, our group um, focused a lot of that research is, is to looking at how to make a very active catalyst and also stable catalyst and selective catalyst, but also at the same time cost effective. I did mention that the, uh, uh, the, the minerals that we require for the energy transitions, it's going to be a lot and it's going to be probably a bottleneck in the future, you know, for us to meet the net zero targets. So there's a lot of efforts now in the research community that working in catalysis, including our group, is to looking at how we can reduce it. Because some of the times we cannot really change the catalyst. We can still, we might still need to use something like platinum. But if we can reduce it 20 times, that means we use 20 times less of these critical minerals and we can make it a bit more sustainably. And we are also looking at how to recycle that as well. So in this project, we're trying to make a, a the, the, the catalyst into a, a sort of cluster of single atoms. Uh, it's very interesting as well, looking at the evolution of our research with time. Because back in 2000, 2002, most of the time when we're talking about making catalysts, we're talking about nano catalysts. At that time, nano is already quite small. And a lot of uh, um, research centers, a lot of projects, a lot of uh, grants, and you can see that it's nano. They want to make nano catalysts. But now, 20 years later, people wanted to look at single atom. People have already the capability to be able to probe, to understand how the single atom catalyst work, and also have the facility to be able to really understand how the single atom or cluster of atoms work. So a lot of focus now in the research of catalysis, um, including the harnessing solar energy, is to make it small and to, to really um, reducing the amount of catalyst mineral that were required as well. Seawater for hydrogen generation. So that's also one of the work that we're doing is, is to look at um, how to use seawater directly. Because uh, as I mentioned before, fresh water is also a precious commodity. Uh, and, and therefore that if we can use seawater, we can use ocean water directly, that will be great. So we're also designing catalysts in terms of to make sure that our catalyst is uh, be able to withstand the uh, corrosiveness of the seawater. Because as we know, seawater got of chloride and got a lot of other cation, and, and therefore that some of the materials can corrode uh, very fast. And this work that we published a couple of years ago, uh, we were looking at uh, using the manganese in order to protect that and in order to be able to use this catalyst to uh, produce hydrogen directly from seawater. So hydrogen is one of the molecules, but uh, using the renewable energy, the sun energy, we are able to also make different uh, chemicals as well. So it's not necessarily has to be only molecules or chemicals that it's using for energy purposes, but molecules that we also use in daily life. Hydrogen peroxide is one of the uh, molecules that uh, we uh, it's, uh, use. It's, it's, it's actually predicted that the, the um, I guess the, the economy of uh, hydrogen peroxide can reach about $5 billion US by 2025. So it's, it's not a, a, a chemical that is um, not widely used. And the, currently, hydrogen peroxide was produced by a process called androquinone process, which is using a lot of organic solvent. And a lot of chemical, actually, in, in chemical engineering and chemical manufacturing, we normally use a lot of organic solvent. And after using those solvent, we need to really dispose it. So it's a problem in terms of the environment because then you create waste that you need to make sure you treat or store um, 
before you can you're allowed to dispose it. But using solar energy and using solar cat catalysis like that, you are able to actually produce the hydrogen peroxide on site. So one of the good things is that because some of those chemicals, they actually produce in a very concentrated form so that you can store it in a small volume and you can transport it in small volume. But when they are concentrated, they are actually quite um, unsafe because uh, there's toxics and so on. And, and therefore, that using technology like this, that you can use directly sunlight and the catalyst to make the, the, the chemicals on site, it's, so, it's actually saved a lot of uh, the problems, environmental problem or energy problem, because you do not have to store it and you do not have to transport it. And you can see that the transport costs and also the, the, the pollutions that it's associated with the, the transportations can be cut down as well. And other projects that we're doing is to looking at, I call it closing the carbon loop. So we're using the sun energy to make hydrogen, which can be, hydrogen can be a, a, a clean fuel to be used, or hydrogen can be a feedstock. We can make something like hydrogen peroxide, but we can also close the carbon loop because I still believe that we will still produce carbon dioxide. Even by 2050, even we plus that net zero is, um, we want to meet the net zero target that uh, carbon emission is zero, but we will still produce that CO2. So to meet the net zero, we do need to really capture the CO2 that we will emit and convert it to something uh, valuable. And in terms of um, uh, carbon, carbon is actually not the bad guy because we need to use carbon in a lot of our, even our pharmaceutical products and things like that, we need carbon. The things that we wear, we need carbon. Uh, plastics, everything, the commodity, the surfactants and, and, and shampoos and everything. So we can use those waste carbon, and, but as long as we're using a sustainable energy to be able to convert it, then we will be able to meet our net zero target. So in our group, we, we started this research closing the carbon loop back in 2015. And when we started it, I could sort of say that uh, um, it's probably more a scientific driven because what we can produce is, is in terms of very, very tiny nanomoles per hour per centimeter square. But because of the, um, I guess the interest and a lot of research putting into that, by 2019, that's already been increased to, to hundreds of micromoles. And recently it's already reached millimoles. And in a bigger system, we will be able to produce um, the, the syn gas. So in, in terms of quite, quite a large quantity, it's, it's not really commercial scale yet, but it sort of uh, can be said that it, it's going, getting there as well and is a promising. I forgot to mention that when I close the carbon loop, we make the carbon dioxide to convert the carbon dioxide. So it's a carbon dioxide that can be from waste and water, which it can be waste water as well, to convert that to a, uh, two molecules called syn gas. It's a carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And syn gas is the building blocks of a lot of materials, a lot of our things. Syn gas can be used in order to make kerosene, syn gas can be used to, to make uh, ethanol, syn gas can be used to make uh, aviation fuels as well. Um, one of the things that when we're talking about the, the decarbonization or, or to meet the net zero, of course we can decarbonize our power industry by using the renewable energy. Uh, or we can also decarbonize our transport using electric vehicles. But there is still no technology yet in order to be able to use electricity for our commercial plane. Um, so one of the things that the aviation industry look at is to see how we can use um, again, sustainable energy, like uh, renewable energy, like uh, solar energy, in order to using CO2 from emission or CO2 from biomass and water or, and hydrogen to make sustainable aviation e kerosene And there's a lot of projects and even so many countries, including Germany, they are looking for countries that can export sustainable aviation fuel as in the form of, they call it e kerosene or um, power kerosene uh, that they would like to, to, to import. And um, I think that it's one of the ways that I see that hydrogen and a lot of this technology can really help to decarbonize the so-called so hard to abate industries. Uh, I forgot to mention, yes, so the, from 2015, into to 2022, we actually upscaled our, our, our productions of the syn gas. And now we are at the stage that we are quite comfortable to talk to also industry to, to looking at asking their help in terms of to help us to sort of upscale it to commercial stage. 
Um, I'm just trying to look at my time, 7-11. OK, um, so look, we're also looking at uh, things to make sure that if when we use it in practical applications, it's still valid. Because you know, in laboratories, normally when you're talking about the, the, the stream of the carbon dioxide, it will be a clean CO2 because we, we, we buy only CO2. But if we're going to use, for so example, CO2 that coming up from uh, emission, so the real plant, they normally will have impurities, like they probably have the NOx, the nitrogen oxide, they have SOx, which is sulfur oxide. And all of those things are very important in our studies to make sure that if you've got impurities, does your catalyst actually be able to still uh, active, still perform accordingly. So a lot of our research here as well, that we're looking at how to be able to make a catalyst that's stable. So when you design a catalyst, it's not just the activities is important. Stability is very important because you don't want to make a catalyst that only work for one hour and then you have to come and replace again and again. So a lot of our research is looking into make sure that the catalyst that we make can also withstand, withstand the impurities uh, of the stream, the, the reactants that we make as well. Um, yeah, so we, we I talk about using the sun energy to make hydrogen. I talk about sun, hydrogen, uh, sun energy to make hydrogen peroxide. I also talk about uh, closing the carbon loop to convert CO2 to syngas. We also could use the same things, the same process in order to make urea. And urea is one of the uh, uh, chemicals that are uh, used in um, it's a fertilizers as well, and, uh, but it's also an important. So what I'm trying to stressed here in terms of presenting that is that there is quite a lot of applications that we can make. So which I, I, I will probably call it a, a sun power to make X and the X can be various things. Now I'm going to talk about a very important um, chemicals. Uh, it's uh, ammonia. Ammonia is used as fertilizers and I think that it's very well important chemicals because this is a chemicals that are probably responsible for the 7 billion populations that we have now because fertilizers are important in terms of growing uh, food. And uh, one of the uh, authors of, co-authors of the papers is here today, uh, Emma sitting on the audience. Thank you, Emma, for coming uh, to support me. Uh, so the process that normally we use, currently use in terms of making ammonia is called the called harbor boss process. So it's, it's, it's a hundred of years old process and it's a, a good process. It has been refined but it used high temperature, 400 degrees, and very high pressures as well, hundreds of, of bar, hundreds of atmosphere. And it utilized 1% of our um, electricity um, energy in order to, to, to make those uh, ammonia globally. And it also emit a lot of CO2 as well. And the reason is because we normally to make the, the, the ammonia, we need to make hydrogen and the hydrogen was, was generated using fossil fuel. So when you gen get that hydrogen from the fossil fuel, you produce a lot of CO2. So the process that we developed here that was a few years ago is, is um, a hybrid plasma electrocatalysis process, which all of those can be powered by renewable energy, by, by uh, sun energy, hopefully. Uh, we can use the sun energy from the solar cell to uh, power the plasma, and then with uh, using again the sun energy to to power the electrochemical processes as well. And the good thing is that this will be done in ambient condition, and we can only use, we, we only need air and water. So air will have the nitrogen in there, eighty percent of it, and we got the water. So air and water with the plasma uh, system, the plasma system will break that triple bond of the nitrogen, which is a very very strong bond. Uh, and to form NOx, and the NOx will then be sent to the electrochemical process in order to convert that to ammonia. Oh, okay, I, I forgot to show this. So, so this, I already mentioned about this one, which is that this is a harbor boss process that I mentioned before. Uh, it's a process that been, is being used, has been used for 100 years, and uh, because of its rely on fossil fuel, so therefore that is emissions, the emission is heavy and also requires significant infrastructure. So our process the, the, is uh, utilizing this uh, plasma and uh, the unit of the plasma that we use is that we utilize both the spark and, and the glow plasma. And 
plasma, if you not know, it's, it's, it's actually ionized gas. So it's, it's sort of like lightning. So if you see lightning, that's, that's the plasma. So we actually generate lightning in the system uh, using the electricity and using our um, also our catalyst in order to cut down the, the electricity required. And that, that plasma is actually the ionic gas. Uh, ionized gas will actually break the, um, the triple bond of nitrogen in order to form the products that we want and therefore that we can convert it to ammonia. So that is if we want to use air and water in order to form ammonia. But we can also use the waste because I guess that this is one of the things that we need to look at nowadays. Um, I mean, I, I'll keep on referring by myself as a sort of chemical engineer and looking at how we can use the waste in order to convert that waste, like a circular economy, to co uh, convert it to products. So NOx actually, it's an emission from a number of industries, including power plants. It's also, you can find NOx in the wastewater treatment as well. So all those NOx actually, if we collect that, we can actually use electrochemical processes in order to convert it to ammonia. So if ammonia is a useful product for fertilizer, or people also now looking at ammonia as a shipping fuel, so fuel for, for maritime. Uh, so if this is the case, then we are able to using waste rather than fossil fuels in order to make some of those chemicals that will be useful for um, either in the chemical industry or in, a, in, a, in the energy industries as well. And we did some economic feasibility because I think nowadays with a lot of uh, the, the research, you do need to do, pay into account the economic considerations if you wanted to start to talk to the industry to support your, your work. So we did do that. And from our work is that our catalyst currently can, um, the, the, the activity, normally the activity we sort of looking at from based on the current density that we can um, generate. So if you look at the, the graph there, one of the things that the criteria we use is looking at the current density because by looking at the current density, then the current density is associated with amount of products that you can produce. So for example, the, the figure E there, the catalyst, the best catalyst that we have there, we can actually um, generate about 150 milliwatt, milliampere per centimeter square, and that's equivalent to the, the ammonia yield of about 400 micromole uh, per centimeter square. So from when we did our, uh, the economic analysis, we found that if we able to use this or make this in a large scale, the ammonium cost will be $7 or eight, roughly about $8 per kilogram, which is still quite dear, quite expensive. In order to meet the criteria that uh, the Department, US Department of Energy sort of used, we need to go down to roughly about $4 per kilogram. We need to increase our current density to, to 800. So we need to really increase that by five times or six times. Therefore, that there's still lots of room to improve. That means that we still need to really do more research in terms of trying to looking at the system and catalyst to be able to improve that as well. So again, uh, having doing the cost analysis, we can go back also to know what is the bottleneck, whether the bottleneck is in terms of the catalyst because of the performance or the bottleneck is, is in terms of the, the, the cost of the electricity. And in uh, that figures is that, the, of course, the cost of electricity is playing a, a big role, but also the performance of the catalyst plays a big role as well. Okay, another system that we're looking at is that um, uh, photoelectrochemical processes. With the photoelectrochemical processes is that what we have is that we illuminate both sides of the electrode with the sunlight. Um, so the, the good things of these photoelectrochemical processes is that if you illuminate it with the sunlight, you do not need a photo, uh, the solar cells and then using the solar cell, uh, it, the electricity from the solar cell in the, to power the electrolyzer because I mentioned before, the electrolyzers is quite costly, quite expensive. And also, if you have different system, you do also need other power converter. Uh, you also need to also have a, perhaps a buffer system, like when the, 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 the solar cells, um, there's no sunlight, you, you not have electricity from the sun, then you have to have a battery you know, to buffer it to make sure that your electrolyzer is, uh, is performing. Because some of the electrolyzer, you cannot just switch on and shut down all the time because it, it doesn't really work that way. 
and therefore that we're looking at also a system that we can using photoelectrochemical processes. It's sort of like a leaf. So you you got a, a electrode system that um, one side you are doing the oxidation reaction, another side you're doing the reduction reactions, and you illuminate it by both ways. And this is one of the works that we're doing as well in terms of to looking at harnessing the solar energy. Although the um, uh, the, the efficiency is not as high as if you're using solar cell and electrolysis. It's one of the reasons it because that, you know, solar cell, that's, we, we have already invested a lot of uh, time and resources to make, to optimize it. And the same thing with the electrolyzer, with the photoelectrochemical processes, that's uh, still limited, but the, the good part of it is that we will be able to use a simpler system in order to be able to make the chemicals uh, uh, by harnessing the solar light. I think I'm going to skip a few of these. Um, now, because it's conscious about the time, I'm talking about uh, harnessing the light, which is the, the photon, and to activate the catalyst to drive the chemical reactions. I also talk about using the electron that coming from the sun energy in order to activate the catalyst, drive the electron. And I also mentioned that, that there's about 50% of the sunlight is actually the heat, and how we can use the sun heat uh, to be able to uh, activate the, the catalyst as well. So this is one of the work that we're doing uh, in our research. And so part of the work is that um, to look at design the catalyst, design an active catalyst that could actually um, harness the sunlight and, and the sun heat together in order to be able to um, uh, embrace the whole solar spectrum and um, to make methanol. And we found that by doing that, we can get a much more selective catalyst in terms of to make the methanol. In addition to that, we also build uh, systems. And, you know, as an engineer, you always like to make the, the materials, but you also would like to also design the system in order to really make it work. So this particular system was uh, built uh, a few years ago in terms of looking at harnessing the sun heat. So we have a, a solar collector uh, and, and in order to heat up the, the reactors, in order to uh, activate the catalyst. And in these reactors here, what we have is an integrated solar thermal catalyst and solar electrolyzer process. So what we have here, uh, a solar panel that will um, give the electricity or generate the electricity to power the electrolyzer in order to split water to hydrogen. And the hydrogen with the CO2, so the CO2 was actually inside the red box there. The CO2 and the hydrogen will go to the reactor system um, and will be heated up by the, the solar collectors there, and, and the reaction will uh, go on, and that will be used in order to make methane, methane or methanol. So this system do not need any electricity, uh, the, 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 the grid's electricity, it's a sort of a one, it's a one system that can use, utilize in order to make uh, the hydrocarbons that we require and also to recycle the CO2 as well. This is the second version. optimizing the, the reactions, because some of the reactions, it's best at that 200 degree, uh, then the solar tracker will help in terms of uh, maintain that temperatures as well. So what I sort of uh, talked to you so far in terms of harnessing solar energy to chemicals and uh, fuels, I can say that um, it's a process that I call it, we call it power to X, that you can use the renewable power or renewable sun in order to make X. 
And this is one of the ways to be able to store this intermittent renewable energy like sun or wind in chemical energy. And the chemical energy can be used as a chemical feedstock or can be used as fuels as well. Um, now I want to turn to a couple of uh, works that we're doing uh, for New South Wales government because this is Royal Society of New South Wales. And so in addition to doing sort of research in the laboratory, we're also looking at helping the uh, government to looking at how we'll be able to really uh, bringing these technologies uh, to New South Wales. And last year we produced a report, we call it the New South Wales Power to X Industry the pre-feasibility study, a roadmap, roadmap of uh, P2X economy in New South Wales. And in that report, we're looking at uh, sort of different technologies, different emerging technologies from New South Wales University, but also locations or where we think that it will be a good place to have this power to X. Um, I know that's a lot of talk about hydrogen, and hydrogen to be the, uh, the, the, the clean energy futures. But at the same time, we, can, we see that there's a lot of other molecules as well that are important, like I already mentioned about ammonia and also the e kerosene or sustainable aviation fuel. So in, in, in that particular um, report, we're looking at all those um, molecules. And actually, I was told that this report was translated to three different languages, Japanese, Mandarin, and, and uh, Korean because uh, they see that the potential for attracting those companies, those uh, investors to come to New South Wales in terms of uh, looking at uh, building this power to X uh, economy in New South Wales. And recently uh, also we uh, awarded the New South Wales Decarbonisation Innovation Hub. And uh, this is a hub in order to provide a platform to foster development and commercialisations of uh, decarbonized technologies to meet the net zero target and also for economic benefits because nowadays when we're talking about decarbonization it's not just about you know climate change and yes definitely it's, it's very important but it's also to build the economies as well so we have the hub and um, under the hub there are three networks we got the land and primary industry network have the electrification and energy system network and i'm responsible for the power fuel including hydrogen network and in that network we bring in together different companies. Some of the companies are not companies in the New South Wales, but we're bringing them into New South Wales in order to, um, to build the whole value chain. Because when you make power fuel, you cannot be just one particular company. You, can, you need a companies that generate, uh, have the technology to generate the electrons, the renewable electron. You need the companies that in terms of the electrolyzer manufacturing, uh, you need the companies in terms of also the pipe Line. So we are talking about that you're working on, you know, uh, sectors from hydrogen plumbers to finance sectors as well. We're going to bring the financial sectors as well in there in order to be able to evaluate and analyze the uh, uh, economy of the power fuel in New South Wales. So I guess the take home message of you, um, the potential of sun energy is enormous. As I mentioned from the numbers there, two hours of sunbeams, that's enough to power this uh, whole world energy for one year. Another thing that I guess that when people talk about, okay, energy transitions, good, that's great, but where will the minerals come from? So if when you're talking about energy transitions, if you wanted to use solar panels, um, you want to use wind turbine, where are the energy, where will be the minerals come from? They will be from mining, right? And therefore that it's very important that we also decarbonize those mining industry, not just to decarbonize our power industry. And when I'm talking about the technology that, that required in harnessing the sun energy through the catalysis, I mentioned a lot about electrolyzer. The electrolyzer would require, for example, if this is the proton exchange membrane electrolyzer, we need uh, platinum. And again, all those are limited resources. So we need to make sure that we take into considerations when we're looking at energy transition, not just that the source of the energy, yes, the renewable energy, sun is always there, but the minerals are limited. And when we talk about harnessing the solar energy, currently most of the people just talking about harnessing that sun energy to make generate electricity. Yes, that's definitely, we, can, we should do that power. But we also need to diversify the use of the um, renewable energy to meet the net zero targets. And there are a lot of different industries. We can looking at the heavy industry 
for example, the ammonia, steel industries, uh, cement making, those are the very hard to decarbonize industry, hard to abate industry. Those are the places that I, I see the potentials in terms of using those molecules that we make from the sun energy for those industries as well. And some of those technologies that I mentioned, we can also use it for decentralized. I used an example of hydrogen peroxide before that you can make it on site. You can also make on site ammonia as a fertilizer. So there you do not have to go to Barnings to buy the fertilizer. You can make the ammonia on site in order for, for use in the farms and as well as well. So those are the different things that I see that the, the, the power of the power to X or power of the sun to X. Okay. I would like to leave you with this uh, quote. Uh, some of you who attended my talk before, you probably know where this quote coming from. Humanity stands before a great problem of finding new raw materials and new sources of energy that shall never become exhausted. In the meantime, we must not waste what we have, but must live as much as, as, much as possible for coming generations. If you look at the quote, that's definitely very relevant for today's. This is a quote from Swante Arrhenius about 100 years ago. So you can see the scientists then already think about us. So we do need to think about our future generations to make sure that our future generations have a planet to live comfortably. I would like to use this opportunity to thank my, my group, the Particle and Catastrophe Research Group. This is a photo that was taken uh, recently on the rooftop. Um, and all my collaborators that the works that are presented today and, and thanks to the ARC, ARENA, uh, Australian Government, Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade and the New South Wales Chief Scientist Office and thank you very much for coming today and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, that's actually part of the work that we're doing. Um, say, for example, for example, the, the platinum, the platinum is still one of the best catalysts for many different applications because of the, the, the no, noble metal like that is normally very stable, while catalysts like nickel, for example, that normally good, but the stability is less. So sometimes in our work, what we're trying to do is that because platinum is much more expensive and also rare, so we couple it. So we're using nickel and platinum together. So in terms of your questions about the screening, I, I think that that is one of the things that's already um, been used a lot with, the, let's say, for example, platinum and nickel. So that's widely accepted. The new catalyst, for example, that we, because I again, we need to diversify it. We need to look at different min minerals so that we can also use the cat or min minerals that it's never been used before. So those are the things that we currently actually have a project of uh, using machine learning to try to help us as well. So we're using machine learning and theoretical calculation to screen those catalysts in terms of to look at the electronic properties. We need to do some experiments, but experiments are quite limited. But using the machine learning, it can help us to speed up some of the uh, catalysts discovery as well. Thank you, Professor Rose. Um, Dibod Molnar is my name. I'm from Sydney University. Um, a, uh, uh, controlling climate change and global warming is an issue of some concern. And I've heard say that uh, eliminating carbon dioxide emissions is part of the solution, but it's now got to the point where we have to start removing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And uh, one of your latest slides mentioned briefly about direct carbon capture from the air. Now, its current density is probably about one part in 25,000, which is not very high density. 
Uh, what can you tell us about technology which is available for capturing carbon dioxide out of the air and how energy efficient is that and how can we do that effectively? Right. Okay, very good questions. I, I, I guess that concentration of concentration, uh, carbon dioxide currently is about 417 ppm and I think there's a lot of uh, discussions in terms of to lower it to about 380 ppm. Um, uh, the direct air captures depends on who you talk to. Uh, and yes, definitely it's very energy intensive currently. Um, and it needs to be improved because as you sort of say, the concentrations, but so now there are quite a number of uh, materials they, they're making that, for example, Sydney University, they have got the metal organic framework and our group also working on that as well. To looking at the way of be able to capture the CO2 more efficiently. Um, and I think other things that people also use in terms of uh, is using scrubber. But again, it's because of the low concentration, you have to keep on pumping again and again. So to answer your questions, the technology now hasn't reached there yet, but I think we need to find that technology. We need to discard the technology. In fact, that when you're looking at the International Energy Agency report that was came out 2021, to meet the net zero, they sort of say that we really do not have the technology yet. To, to do that. I think we still need to discover that some of the emerging technology even hasn't been discovered. It's not just the emerging technologies there that can take us. So I think there's still a lot of work to, to do. And, and I, I, you see one of the slogan that we use is, you know, much to be optimistic about, much, much more to be done. Thank you. As I said, my chemistry is at second year university level, so probably a bit, bit behind. Um, we've talked, you've mentioned catalysts, and I wondered if you could actually describe what are the features of a good catalyst. Okay. So I think in catalyst, normally we look at three things, the activity, the selectivity, and, and also the stability, right? It depends on what reactions you wanted to use. But if it's a photocatalyst, for example, so this is the, the one that you go in to use the light directly to activate it. So you need to make sure that the catalyst can be activated by that particular light, by sunlight. So you need to have the right, um, they call it the band gap um, in terms of uh, to be able to be activated. And also you need to make sure that it has a good uh, electron transfer because a lot of these reactions are redox reactions, oxidation and redox uh, and reductions. So you need to make sure that it have a good electron transfer. And again, catalysts, it, the work in the chemical reactions, you break the bond and you make the bond, right? So with the chemical reactions. So you need to make sure that when to, 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 to break the bond, you need the molecules to come to the catalyst surface. You need it to be good to adsorb it. But then later on, when you break the bond, you need to be able to desorb it to release the products. So again, the surface properties that can adsorb the reactant, but can desorb the, the products uh, efficiently. previously about killing two birds with one stone. The catalyst you've talked about are minerals largely. Is there any chance to couple you know, harvesting the minerals that are needed from recycling processes rather than you know, digging them out of the earth? Yeah, um, so one of the things that, that's what we were talking about now is because uh, you know, uh, when people looking at uh, solar panel uh, or even battery, previously when they're looking at it, they do not really thinking about the end of the lifetime. So how are we going to be able to really recycle it back uh, or, or upcycling, that's another one. So I think nowadays in terms of the catalyst for electrolyzer, something that we're looking at as well in, in some of, uh, we have a new centers of excellence. It's part of the, the, the program is to looking at when we re, uh, design our catalyst and electrolyzer system, we need to make sure that it's a way of that we'll be able to recycle it at the, at the end of the lifetime. So it's, it's not, the, and, and reuse it again to sort of see whether we can really just take that out and then leach it and then repurpose it again in terms of to make it uh, as an active catalyst. But some of the minerals that you are looking at are potentially available in, you know, breaking up of old phones or televisions or, or the like. Yes. Is there a potential to harvest from, from those sources yes. for your so, use? 
Yes, yeah, so so that that's uh, we could also looking at, but I think that will be using at looking at how to really harvest the the uh, the phone the the minerals from the phone as well, because again, some of those devices. Uh, unfortunately, when they design it, it was not meant to be sort of recycling. Okay. So what I meant is that you know when we're looking at the new system that we design, we have to make sure that it's a system that we can recycle. Okay, uh, right. Now I notice batteries still feature in a lot of your your um, processes. So we're still hamstrung by the the expense and the storability capacity of batteries. It's always going to be a a bottleneck for what you're doing or not? Um, with, with the work that we're doing, if you're yep. sort of using electrolyzer, you don't really need the battery. Yep. But uh, if you're looking at using the electric car, for example, then, then the battery will be, need to be there. Hmm. The, the, the thing is that battery will still need to be there because uh, I, I still see that that is a solution for storage of uh, hmm. electric, renewable electricity. Um, and what we're doing in terms of looking at hydrogen or looking at other molecules, that is uh, probably the alternative. Uh, but it will not be able to replace the battery because they will still be there because battery is very efficient in terms of the return efficiency. So you got the electricity coming from the solar panel, storing the battery, and then you, you know, 70, 80% can be sort of again generate again as the electricity while other processes like the hydrogen fuel cells the efficiency is much lower so i still see that battery will be still up there for many applications yeah. but for hard to abate industry say for example the aviation fuel as i mentioned the sustainable we we, pro, we will not be able to use the battery because it will yeah. be too big, big of battery yeah. required in terms of mm. to fly a commercial mm. plane so those are the ones that i see the power fuel that we're talking about before that will be uh, one of the uh, solutions Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Now, any more questions out in the audience? Thank you very much, Rose. Um, I always learn something new. I, I'm curious, and this might be asking you to look in a crystal ball, but through your talk, you spoke about, you know, initially looking at waste remediation and now shifting to, toward energy being a real key driver, and similarly with catalysis about nanoclusters until into single atoms is where the focus is now. Do you have any predictions of in the next 10 or so years where focus really needs to shift so that we can drive the transition forward? I, I think what we need to focus on now is also looking at, um, uh, I think, recycling and upcycling as well. Because uh, this is something that I, I feel that, you know, there's still a lot of people, a lot of the industry do not really think that this is going to be a problem, the, the, the lack of the critical minerals. Because the, from the IE, the, again, I always refer to International Energy Agency report because I've, I've, I believe that they could give a very good report. Uh, it's the needs of those critical minerals for the energy transitions is really alarming. Um, and I think what I would say that in terms of looking at uh, the, the new, new process and new technologies later on is to make sure that the technology we develop something that we can recycle, uh, repurpose, if not, uh, or reuse as well. Uh, it, it, it will not be sustainable. Great. Well, thank you very much, Rose. That was amazing. I mean, it really is stunning the amount of work you're doing. So on behalf of the Royal Society, I thank you for talking to us tonight about your work and, and congratulations for the medal as well. Thank you.